For reasons yet to be determined, the bodies of the recently deceased are returning to life and attacking the living. This pandemic has spread faster than any disease in modern history. <laughs> of a biological weapon known as the T-Virus. The entire city was infested with zombies. Dr. Bergen, you come along with us quietly. You want to believe me, I can explain. This is my life's work. I'm not handing over anything. We have our orders, Dr. Bergen. Which of this was according to Spencer's plan? all evidence that the virus ever existed. But there isn't going to be any rescue. We have to get out of here. The Raccoon City Destruction Incident this is a term that refers to the deadly 1998 viral outbreak event that occurred in Raccoon City. By now, this is a dark yet familiar term, marking a day in 1998 that would change the world forever. It was an incident that revealed the corruption and deception of one of the world's most powerful corporations, ushered in a new generation of bioterrorism across the globe, and it was the first time an American city was wiped out in a nuclear strike. For almost a decade after the incident, and many years after the Umbrella Corporation was officially outlawed and disbanded, a staggering amount of information was withheld from the public. Even after more information became available, and similar bioterror events unfolded worldwide, the whole truth behind the destruction of Raccoon City and what led to it has been hidden from the public. And because of this, the whole true story of America's lost city has never been told. To make sense of this historic catastrophe, we must delve into the events that led to the outbreak in the city. This documentary aims to do just that by using a variety of information, documentation, video, and testimony to bring you a concise chain of events. Contained within is some information that was previously unreleased to the public. Thanks to the test of time and the persistence of truth, we're finally, after 24 years, able to bring you the whole story of Raccoon City. Raccoon City was a small Midwestern American city situated within the Arclay Mountain region also known as Arclay County. The whole of Arclay County was made up of three areas, Raccoon City, Cedar District, and Stoneville. Cedar and Stoneville were smaller suburban villages, while Raccoon City was, as the name implies, a city. At the time, Raccoon was much smaller than other cities across America. But for Arclay County, it was the perfect mixture of city and suburban living, right in the middle of nowhere. In the decades prior to the 1960s, Raccoon City was hardly a city, but it did still serve as the economic hub for the entire Arclay County. As the United States began massive modernization projects across the nation, so too did Raccoon City. Raccoon City seemed to stand still in time until about 1969 when urbanization really took off. A tram line between Stoneville and Raccoon, the Kite Brothers subway system, and the Raccoon City Police Department all sprang up that year. But something else would pop up in Raccoon City that very same year. Commitment 
honesty, integrity, these are the core values that create the foundation for Umbrella. Umbrella Pharmaceuticals. It's this foundation that will continue to build a brighter future for all of us. To fully understand the Raccoon City destruction incident, we must first delve into the origins of the Umbrella Corporation. The former pharmaceutical giant is, by all accounts, responsible for the catastrophe that befell Raccoon City. But what was Umbrella truly? Who were the people behind it? And what were their intentions and motivations? Here is what we know for sure. Umbrella was founded in Europe in 1968 under Oswell E. Spencer, alongside his close friends James Marcus and Dr. Edward Ashford. At an early age, Spencer had become obsessed with the idea of using eugenics to create a genetically perfect human race. As Spencer went through his early school years and into college, his obsession would turn into desire driven by his aptitude in scientific practices. Oswell, Marcus, and Ashford had become good friends while attending a Swiss university together. They studied what was then the emerging field of virology. They were also believers in eugenics, with Oswell being particularly interested in creating the perfect race of humans, using scientific methodology, and had formed a small eugenics circle with other university members, who would later serve as Umbrella's executive board. Even after graduating from college, Spencer kept up on developments in eugenic studies throughout the mid-20th century. In 1966, while working in the lab of another Swiss university with James Marcus as a partner, Spencer organized an expedition to West Africa. They were chasing Spencer's obsession with a particular account from the Natural History Conspectus, a 19th century Victorian encyclopedia written by British explorer Henry Travis. The idea was to locate the Sun and Trep, or Stairway of the Sunflower, which Travis detailed in the Conspectus, having himself come across this flower in the hands of a West African tribe called the Nidipaya. The fantastical way in which Travis described the flower and its effects on humans led Spencer to interpret that a virus could be produced from the flower, with the capability of mutating the host. Spencer's physical involvement in the expedition is still unknown, but James Marcus, along with his protege Brandon Bailey, did embark on the expedition and returned in 1967 with proof that Spencer's interpretation of the flower's abilities were indeed correct. Having discovered a virus, within the strange red flower. Using the wealth from his prestigious upbringing, as well as funding from the eugenic circle, Spencer began work on studying the virus, which he dubbed Progenitor, and also beginning construction on several laboratories and properties within and outside the United States. One of these properties would become the infamous Spencer Mansion. The virus would require a great deal of modification to ensure candidates for the program would not be killed. None in the circle had such funding available and consequently, Spencer proposed they establish a pharmaceutical company that would raise the funding. Edward agreed to the proposal along with a reluctant Marcus. For products which improve the quality of living, Pharmaceuticals to maintain and improve health. Colors and chemicals for the things we use. Alongside pharmaceuticals, the three founders agreed to separate Progenitor into a eugenics and a bioweapons project, so profits would come from catering to the American military. The bioweapons portion of the project is what officially and originally got the term T-Virus Project. 
Rather than perform his own research, Spencer left the bioweapons research and development to trusted executives within the new Arclay Mansion Laboratory, while running company matters with other Circle members between the Netherlands and France. James Marcus was made director of the new Executive Training Facility, also located in the Arclay Mountain region, and placed him in charge of the T-Virus program, which experimentation and research would be shared with the Mansion Lab. Finally, Edward Ashford would be placed in charge of various research projects at a third facility, built in Antarctica. As it was the goal of Umbrella to use bioweapon sales to fund the progenitor research, they were able to find willing buyers within the United States government, so long as they provided viable bioweapons for use in anti-insurgent operations. This, of course, was a direct violation of the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention. I have decided that the United States of America will renounce the use of any form of deadly biological weapons that either kill or incapacitate. President Nixon visited Fort Detrick on the 25th of November, 1969. I remember that date quite well because following his announcement of taking munitions and beating them to plowsheds, we all lost our job. And that was a very traumatic experience. But following his presidential announcement on the, this date, the, the entire United States offensive program on biological warfare came to a close within two years. We destroyed all of our seed stocks. We destroyed all of our production material at Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And we completely got out of the biological warfare business. The statement ended, unconditionally, all U.S. offensive biological weapons programs. The BWC sought to supplement the Geneva Protocol and was negotiated in the Conference of the Committee on Disarmament in Geneva from 1969 to 1972. Following the conclusion of the negotiation of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Despite the Biological Weapons Convention becoming international law, there were still buyers within the United States military industrial complex that were eager to get their hands on whatever umbrella was cooking up. Under the nose of the White House, the military industrial complex would help umbrella hide its laboratories and biological weapons programs. The Spencer Mansion was this big, ominous, yet grand structure, placed in the most dense, forested section of the Arclay Mountain region. I often hiked through the forest, but since the center was located in a mountain region, there was never anyone to be found nearby. The only method of transportation was by helicopter, and the center wasn't exactly the type of place that people came to visit. Despite the namesake, it was hardly the kind of mansion you wanted to live in. One important reason for the fact that the center was located in such an isolated location was to prevent the virus from getting out in the instance of a leak. That's what all the secrecy was about when it came to the mansion itself. Spencer was investing a lot of time and material into researching the progenitor virus, which apparently required some extremely elaborate laboratory setups. Not only that, but the deals Umbrella struck with the different government entities required them to keep the bioweapons research and development out of the public eye. So, they chose a spot in the Arclay Mountain region, which sat on top of already existing limestone caverns. The forest would provide the mansion with a shield from the population's eye, and the caverns proved to be the perfect place to construct a lab. Whenever I would leave the center for a walk in the woods, I would always think to myself, why did Spencer choose this place? The Spencer mansion was quite a structure from what I've seen of it sort of reminds you of a Winchester mystery house or even H.H. H. Holmes murder hotel in regards to the construction. 
You see, Spencer hired New York architect firm Trevor and Chamberlain, big time NYC architects at the time, to build the mansion. Which brings me to the reason why I mentioned that it reminded me of the Hotel H.H. Holmes built. Holmes had a nefarious reason to build that place and used an elaborate but almost senseless design to mask it. Long halls with lots of doors, dead ends, and even fatal booby traps. Pretty much the same story as the Spencer Mansion. The house section itself was designed with living in mind. After all, if it was going to serve as a cover-up for the lab, the house had to be livable. It was built with luxury in mind, given how wealthy and prestigious the Spencer family was known to be. A grand foyer, massive dining room, various guest rooms and bathrooms, office spaces, outdoor catwalks, everything you would find in your everyday mansion. The elegant design would serve the mansion's first role, providing misdirection. Its second role was security. Since the house itself would remain relatively unoccupied, Spencer secretly had George Trevor design and construct several trap mechanisms throughout the main house. Ceilings that dropped, walls that closed in on each other, spike traps, automatic lock mechanisms on doors, and even a ventilation system that could fill some rooms with the noxious fumes. Even the design of the hallways and placement of rooms was meant to confuse any would-be trespassers. The center was an extremely dangerous place to run virus research. And if you really think about it, the location of the Ashford Antarctica Research Center was really a much safer and obvious choice. It would almost seem as if this place was specifically chosen as a location for the purpose of spreading the virus. But I just can't imagine that would really be so. What makes this bit of information so significant is what happened to George Trevor following the mansion's completion. When the mansion was finally completed in 1967, Spencer invited George, along with his wife and daughter, Jessica and Lisa, to stay at the mansion. On November 10, 1967, Jessica and Lisa Trevor left for the Spencer Mansion, with George planning to follow along in a few days after completing some leftover work. Shortly after their arrival, Jessica and Lisa were captured by lab security staff and imprisoned within the lab itself. Spencer, being the deeply paranoid man that he was, wanted to ensure the secrets of the mansion never got out. He was also keen to the idea of using the mother and daughter pair as test subjects for the various viral programs being conducted at the lab. George Trevor would arrive at the mansion on November 13, 1967. He was treated as a guest upon arrival, but was told his wife and daughter had to leave to visit a sick relative and that they'd be back in just a few days. After seven days of waiting, George decided to leave the mansion and look for his family but he too was also captured. George did manage to escape captivity, but would find his way into the twisting caverns around and under the lab. After several days of eluding lab security, he stumbled into a small passage hoping to find escape. What he found instead was a gravestone with his name chiseled on the face. It was here that he would eventually succumb to hunger and injury. Weeks earlier, Jessica Trevor had died almost immediately after being captured, as she did not take well to the viral testing. On the other hand, Lisa was receiving the viral testing better than any other subject the Arclay team previously worked with, prompting them to keep her alive for the sake of continued testing over time. With Umbrella established, Spencer became increasingly paranoid that his friends would threaten his own eugenics project, which he secretly intended to steer towards making himself a godlike figure in the new world order in which he envisioned. Although he already controlled the project by 1967, after having secured Marcus's research from the African expedition, Spencer's paranoia reached a point of escalation in 1968. That year, 
he orchestrated an accident with the progenitor virus, killing Edward Ashford and leaving all the Antarctic research programs in the hands of his son, Alexander Ashford. They were aristocrats, entitled and sustained by a greed for power. Having been involved in the foundation of Umbrella, the Ashford family had also independently performed research on the Veronica virus. However, 15 years ago, Alexander Ashford disappeared under mysterious circumstances. To make things worse, Alexander's daughter Alexia, a child prodigy who played a key role in the research, died at a young age. The Ashford lineage gradually lost its power to the corrupt hands of the Umbrella Corporation. Alexia's brother, Alfred, was demoted to a mere supervisor, and he was sent to command a private detention facility on an isolated island in the Southern Seas, alone. Dr. James Marcus's research reached a breakthrough in September of 1977, discovering a highly infectious viral variant through his own progenitor research. He had even reported this breakthrough to the Umbrella Executive Board in January of 1978. It was actually Marcus that coined the name T-Virus for his viral variant to divorce the strain from the progenitor virus. At last, I've discovered a way to build a new virus type with progenitor as its base. Mixing it with leech DNA was the breakthrough I had needed. I called this new virus T, but tyrant. The nearby Arclay Laboratory was also, at the time, working on progenitor type A and type B mutant strains. The reasons things start getting confusing is because they too use T-Virus as the name for their newly discovered strains. In the late quarter of 1978, James Marcus was suddenly dismissed from his role with the company. The executive training facility, in which Marcus was based out of, was decommissioned by Umbrella, and all its staff and research projects were moved to the Arclay lab. Two members of the executive training facility staff would later play a role in events, William Birkin and Albert Wesker. Marcus, who was already beginning to suspect Spencer is trying to steal his work, opted to remain at the now abandoned training facility and continue his work on the perfected strain, with intention of presenting it to Umbrella's executive directors, hoping the success would convince them to replace Spencer with him at the head of Umbrella. William Birkin and Albert Wesker were both assigned to head the T-Virus project, as Spencer was well aware that Wesker and Birkin were two of few people Marcus trusted and worked closely with. July 31st. 1978. The first time I visited that place, it was the summer of my 18th year. That makes it about 20 years ago. As I got off the helicopter, I remembered the sight of the swirling wind the helicopter blades whipped into the air. When viewed from above, the old mansion seemed quite normal. But when seen from the ground, there was something foreboding and unapproachable about it. Birkin, my junior by two years, seemed, as usual, to be only concerned with the document he was holding. We were assigned to the mansion two days earlier, on the day that the executive training center we had belonged to was closed. It all seemed like it was planned, too much of a coincidence. From that day on, the Arclay Research Center was ours. As chief researchers, we were put completely in charge of all aspects of the facility. Hmm. Of course, that is just how Spencer had planned it all out. He chose us. The origin of the company was to create new starter viruses by recombining genes. In order to produce biological weapons out of these new starter viruses, they began studying virus mutations in order to strengthen the basic viruses they had created. This was known as the T-Virus Experiment. The T-Virus project had one goal, 
to create a bioweapon with the virus that had a 100% fatality rate, which of course is something any military would be willing to buy. The whole time we were riding in the elevator, Birkin never took his eye off the documents he was holding. The document that Birkin was scrutinizing so closely was a report about a new virus that has shown up in Africa. It was called Ebola. At this moment, there were many people all throughout the world who were studying the Ebola virus. However, I think there were two major reasons why they were studying it. To help people and to kill them. The reason Birkin was so interested in the Ebola virus was that he was thinking of recombining the Ebola genes into a starter virus to strengthen its attributes. Fascinated by Ebola's potential as a weapon, Birkin noted that people would be killed too quickly for it to work in war adequately. The Ebola virus had too many weak spots. First of all, the virus could only survive for a few days, if not inside a human body. It would soon die if under sunlight, ultraviolet light, for too long. Secondly, since it kills the host too quickly, there isn't enough time to transfer, infect other hosts. Finally, the virus is only transferable through direct touch, and so it can be easily prevented. Try to imagine the following. If a person who was heavily infected, the disease had spread all throughout their body, could actually stand and walk around, and without knowing it, was in direct contact with other people of their own accord. What if the RNA of the Ebola virus could actually alter a person's genetic code? And if, through that, a person was able to carry the virus without dying? What if this person had the resilience of a monster? That is, wouldn't this person be a living dead whose body carried the virus? Something that could infect others, sort of like a living biological weapon. The team at Arclay made a breakthrough in 1978 under the leadership of Dr. William Birkin. A modified T-virus strain with RNA from Ebola was thusly created, which led to their independent creation of zombies. Now despite this breakthrough, the virus still only sported a 90% fatality rate, with an estimated 10% natural immunity factor in play was impossible to get a 100% infection ratio. Within people, there is a subtle difference that the virus couldn't totally overtake. It seems compatibility was also a major factor. About 10% of the people who were injected with the zombie virus didn't get infected. And this was something that, no matter how hard we researched, we just couldn't overcome. A disease that would affect 90% of all humans seemed to me to be quite an effective weapon. But Spencer didn't see it that way. Spencer said he was hoping for a specialty virus that could easily wipe out everyone. Once they were able to get the A and B strains of the T virus to a 90% fatality rate, the second phase of the project would focus on offsetting that 10% survival rate. By using genetic recombination, Wesker and Birkin began learning how to create creatures that could hunt human survivors. Birkin was planning on making a biological weapon that would increase a country's military capacity, not to just manipulate the genes of the T-virus, but also by adding other genetic code. He was planning on creating him a military biological weapon that could annihilate those who went unaffected by the virus, as well as people who were wearing antiviral gear and equipment. This weapon was later named Hunter. The bonding of a fertilized human egg with reptilian DNA using the virus is what resulted in, for example, the creation of the Hunter B.O.W. However, this didn't work on all types of living creatures. 
Sometimes, viral introduction to animal or insect DNA would simply cause a growth in size, but left their intelligence all the same, leaving them untrainable and virtually useless. In the case of dogs, the virus showed promising results as the Cerberus was still trainable even after infection. The Doberman Pinscher's genetic makeup accounts for its ability to utilize innate protective instincts, a high level of intelligence, and a natural response to evaluating a threat in order to perform as a guardian. Another notable random effect of the viral strains was the V-Act process. In some cases, when a zombie is knocked unconscious, it undergoes the V-Act process. Within an hour or so, the zombie mutates rapidly, developing sharp claws, teeth, and a drastic speed up of the heart's pumping system. This increase in blood flow throughout the body causes the zombie's skin to sport a crimson hue. This, along with their aggressive nature, is what led the Arclay researchers to dubbing the creatures as Crimson Heads. In an effort to finalize his power over the T-Virus program, Spencer sought to eliminate the rogue James Marcus, who is still unable to present his findings to the Umbrella executive directors. In 1988, an Umbrella Security Service squad infiltrated the training facility lab and killed James Marcus, shortly after completing his Queen Leech experiment. William Birkin and Albert Wesker accompanied the team on the raid and quickly secured any research data of relevance to their own T project. It would later be discovered that Marcus's body, along with any of his unwanted research specimens, were dumped into a nearby river channel. By the time 1998 rolls around, James Marcus was virtually wiped out of Umbrella's history, only keeping records to show he was dismissed in 1978. With all perceived obstacles removed and a trove of research and findings obtained from his former partners, Spencer watched as the Arclay Lab slowly manifested his twisted ambition into reality. Using the new information from Marcus's work, Birkin and Wesker would move on to start various research projects and develop more mutant strains of T-Virus, all of which would be helped along by a particular unwilling test subject. We hadn't heard a single word about her before. She was a secret of the utmost confidentiality at the research center, and they didn't let any information about her out of the compound. According to the records, she was at the research center from the very moment it was first built. She was 25, but we didn't know her name, nor why she was here. She was to be used as the experimental subject host for the T-Virus. The day we began the experiment was November 10th, 1967. We did T-Virus experiments on her for all of 11 years. As the 1980s came to a close, Raccoon City began expanding beyond its original limits, and with the Arclay Mountain region being as beautiful as it is, the city started attracting a tourism business based on the area's hiking and wilderness offerings. In the 1990s, the National Recession hit Raccoon City hard. However, former Mayor Michael Warren's bright Raccoon 21 plan sort of saved the city which that plan was heavily funded by Umbrella, of course. This plan brought Raccoon General Hospital to the city and helped to finance the creation of the independent law enforcement agency we once knew as the STARS team. The Raccoon Police Department was established in 1969 when the then city's rapid expansion necessitated a dedicated police force beyond the Arclay County Sheriff's Department. Raccoon's Art Museum, which had closed down, was purchased by the RPD the same year to be used as their base of operations. When Mayor Michael Warren began preparation for the Bright Raccoon 21 project in the early 1990s, 
the force received extra funding from various local companies, including Umbrella USA, who wanted assurances that the RPD could deal with the increase in crime rate and the threat of domestic terrorism. The ambulances were confronted with two dead victims, literally hundreds of injured, and at least 15 hurt seriously. From this funding, the Special Tactics and Rescue Service was established. Though STARS was not part of the RPD, it was based within the Raccoon Police Station, and its officers held the power of arrest like local police did. The Raccoon Police Department was comprised of several divisions, including the Patrol Division, Special Weapons and Tactics, the Special Tactics and Rescue Service, and Canine Units. The department was commanded by Chief Brian Irons, a man known to have an explosive temper and later revealed to have been one of many city officials paid by Umbrella in the form of bribes. This under-the-table relationship between Umbrella and the RPD ensured that the Raccoon City Police Department never went through with any investigations against them. Sometime in 1993, the Arclay Lab team created another strain of variant of the T-Virus. T-JCCC203 was an experimental oncolytic virus, which is a virus that specifically targets cancerous cells. There are two main ways that oncolytic viruses help fight cancer. First, they kill cancer cells directly when they infect these cells and cause them to burst. Second, when the cancer cells die, they release telltale markers called antigens into the body. These cancer antigens are taken up by cells of the immune system, which then alert our body's attack cells, the T cells, to look for and kill cancer elsewhere in the body. However, this extremely beneficial virus was a T virus strain, so any positive attributes the strain carried were only to mask the true nature of the virus. At this time, Raccoon General Hospital had not been built in the city yet. Instead, a smaller hospital served all three districts of Arclay County, roughly situated in the center of the three, surrounded by the dense Arclay forests. This hospital, as you can imagine, was used as a testing ground by Umbrella. That year, using a dummy pharmaceutical company only referred to as Drug Inc., Umbrella provided the hospital with the experimental T-JCCC203 reagent. It wasn't long before the hospital used the reagent in clinical trials on at least two of its cancer patients, Doug Frost and Dorothy Lester. Dorothy was the wife of Al Lester, the hospital director, and was given the drug upon his request out of hope it might cure her of her terminal condition. Instead. Dorothy mutated into a zombie, which Dr. Lester and the staff kept isolated within the hospital. The Raccoon City Police Department caught wind of the under-the-table imports the hospital was accepting and launched an investigation. Though the activity was indeed to be found illegal, Umbrella's meddling in the police department prevented any charges from being filed, and it also went largely unreported by the media. Kurt Diamond, an investigative journalist for the Raccoon City Press, picked up on the rumors of bizarre experimentation, dealings with foreign business, and suspicious patient deaths coming out of the hospital. Concerned as to why there was a lack of reporting on these incidents, he began an investigation of his own. It was later revealed that Mr. Diamond was murdered shortly after beginning this investigation. Despite Kurt's death being completely covered up, the hospital was shut down anyway, amid other allegations and rumors it had already faced. Grief-stricken and without a job, Albert Lester remained at the hospital. July 31st, 1995. It had been 17 years since I'd been back there. 
When I come, I remember the wind. The scenery and buildings from the surrounding area hadn't changed a bit. I saw Birkin standing on the helipad. He arrived before I did. Meeting with him somehow already seemed nostalgic. It had been four years since I had left the Arclay Research Center. Four years ago, when Birkin's proposed G-Virus plan was approved, I put a transfer request for the data information section, and my request was immediately approved. The fact that I had given up on being a researcher and needed a change probably seemed like a natural change that most people go through. Actually, the truth of the matter was that G had already reached a level that was beyond my ability. As the wind danced around the helicopter, Birkin was, as usual, fixated on some document. Apparently, he was coming to Arclay on a routine basis, but he was no longer assigned there. A while ago, he had been transferred to a huge underground research facility in Raccoon City. That was the main facility for his G-Virus research. But, to tell the truth, four years ago, I really didn't think that Spencer would approve G, because it deviated from the idea of weapon, and it was created with too many unknowns left unsolved. The big difference between G and the T-Virus was that a body infected with G would spontaneously continue to mutate. Of course, a virus's genes are unprotected, so it quickly mutates. But the cells within a living organism are different. Even if the subject's makeup has been altered by the virus, the cells within the organism's body rarely can be mutated. Of course, by using outer stimuli, such as radiation, you can make mutations occur within a living body. However, a body that is infected with G continues to mutate without any outer stimuli until the host dies. Even that T-virus has lots of attributes that are quite similar to G. It has already been observed that the genetic makeup of one of the living biological weapons, a person infected with the T-virus, who has been placed in a special setting, has continuously changed. But in order for this change to occur, it is necessary to use outer stimuli as a catalyst, and one can mildly predict which changes are likely to occur. However, there are no such laws concerning a body infected with G. No one can predict just how someone infected with G will change. No matter what kind of method you use to try to cope with G, it continually changes, making that method ineffective. Seven years ago, Birkin noticed a little bit of this effect in the female test subject. There wasn't the slightest change in her appearance, but deep within her, something was constantly changing, and she continued to coexist with the virus used in the experiments. And so, after 21 years of inner mutations, even the parasite nemesis just became one more mutation within her body. The G-Virus plan was a plan to push those characteristics to the utmost limit. However, the thing that lay ahead could be an evolution to the final form for mankind. Or it could be a finale in which the organism merely dies. Could we really call that a weapon? What was Spencer thinking when he approved this plan? Even though I had been working in the information section for these four long years, I'd still been unable to figure out what Spencer was planning. And now, Spencer has stopped coming to Arclay. Spencer has stopped coming to Arclay. Almost as if something that he has been eagerly awaiting and expecting has begun. Spencer, like some mirage floating in the desert, had begun to grow farther and farther away from me, but I was sure that a chance would present itself to me eventually. That was, of course, if I lived long enough to see that day. Birkin and I got on the elevator and rode to the top floor, to the place where we had first met her. A man named John 
Bergen's successor, a new chief researcher, was waiting there for us. He came from a research center in Chicago and was supposedly a very talented scientist, but he was a little too straight to be working at a place like this. He began to question the inhumanity of what was going on in the labs and made his opinions known to the upper-level executives. I had heard rumors about him at the information section. Everyone seemed to agree that if any information ever leaked out, he probably would have been the culprit. We ignored John and kept on walking, and then began the final disposal procedures on her. You must kill her. Due to her being infected with Nemesis, although only a minor amount, she started to think and become conscious. She started to act in grotesque ways. Her behavior has continued to escalate, and now she wears the face of another woman that she peeled off just like a mask. According to reports, she acted in the same way after they gave her the first starter virus. I don't know why she began to act in such a way. But because she recently killed three researchers, they have decided to dispose of her. Now that the G research is on the right track, there is no real use for a test subject like her. After constantly checking and reconfirming for three days the fact that she was dead, her corpse was, as per facility head's order, taken away somewhere. In the end, I never did find out who she was and why she was brought here. Of course, she was merely a test subject. But still, though, if she hadn't been here then, there wouldn't have been any G-plan, and Birkin and I would probably be leading different lives now. I left the Arclay Research Center, thinking that very thing. I wonder how much of this was according to Spencer's plan. Even though they spent three days in confirming she was dead, Lisa awoke in the Arclay Forest hours after her body was dumped. From here, she would live off the land in the forest, later contributing to reports of strange sightings and murders in the woods. It wasn't until May of 1998 that everything came crashing down for Umbrella and Raccoon City. The Spencer Mansion incident, or Stars Raid, is actually a series of events, rather than just one. It begins with the Epsilon T virus strain being released into the Arclay lab and training facility. One of James Marcus's previous successful experiments, the Queen Leech, had consumed Marcus's body as a food source over the course of several years. It is believed that the sentient creature gained some of Marcus's memories and plotted revenge against Umbrella for their treachery. After spending 10 years perfecting the ability to mimicry into Marcus's image, it finally decided to enact its plan in May of 1998. On May 11th, the Queen Leech set off a containment failure in the Arclay Laboratory, infecting the entire staff with the Epsilon strain of T-Virus. The leak was discovered quickly, causing the lab facility to go into lockdown. Security personnel were ordered to kill any persons attempting to leave, and all of the facility staff was ordered to wear positive pressure personnel suits. Otherwise, work continued as normal, with scientists taking advantage of the incident for further research. At around 5 a.m., Scott woke me up. It scared the shit out of me, too. He was wearing a protective suit. He handed me another one and told me to put it on. It said there'd been an accident in the basement lab. I just knew something like this would happen. Those bastards in research never sleep, even on holiday. Knowledge of the true extent of the accident was known only to a select few. Dr. Albert Wesker, a former Tyrant Project researcher, but by then a security agent, ordered telephone access to the outside world to be cut to prevent information leaks. At this point, at least 78 Umbrella employees, not counting Dr. Wesker's team, were subject to quarantine, 
seven of whom being researchers on transfer from Umbrella HQ, along with at least 24 human test subjects. As early as Wednesday, May 13th, signs of T-virus infection were being displayed among staff members who were neither present or involved in the Tyrant project. Information on the outbreak was, again, limited, and the medical team allowed patients to believe their sores were merely the result of wearing the pressure suits, and provided bandages rather than antiretroviral drugs. The goddamn dogs have been looking at me funny. So I decided not to feed him today. Screw him. Went to the infirmary because my back is all swollen and feels itchy. They put a big bandage on it and told me I didn't need to wear the suit anymore. All I want to do is sleep. The virus began spreading out of the facility, including to the abandoned training facility, on Thursday, May 14th, carried within a pack of escaped Cerberuses which had turned feral from the keeper's apathy towards feeding them. I found another big blister on my foot this morning. I ended up dragging my foot all the way to the dog's pen. They were quiet all day, which is weird. Then I realized some of them had escaped. Maybe this is their way of getting back at me for not feeding them the last three days. If anybody finds out, I'll have my head handed to me. Friday, May 15th marked the first casualty in the incident, a researcher being shot by security personnel while trying to escape from the mansion grounds. Rumors going around that a researcher who tried to escape the estate last night was shot. My entire body feels hot and itchy and I'm sweating all the time now. I scratched the swelling on my arm and a piece of rotten flesh just dropped off. What the hell's happening to me? The earliest known killing due to viral infection took place a week later on Thursday, May 21st, when the keeper murdered a friend, Scott, in a fit of rage and soon after ate him. Itchy, itchy, Scott came. Ugly face so killed him. Tasty. Itchy. Tasty. <laughs> The writings of another man, Martin Crackhorn, indicate that the mansion was lost to the zombified staff by Wednesday, June 3rd, and that he planned to take his own life to avoid becoming a zombie himself. All my colleagues who were infected are dead or dying, and the nature of the disease is such that those still living have lost their senses. This virus robs its victims of their humanity forcing them in their sickness to seek out and spur life. Even as I write these words, I can hear them pressing against my door like mindless, hungry animals. Oma, I have tried to survive, only to see you again. But my efforts only delay the inevitable. I am in fact and there is no cure for what will follow. My life before it was the only thing that separated me from them. My love for you. In an hour, I'll have entered my eternal sleep where there is peace. Please understand. Please know that I'm sorry. On Monday, June 8th, Chief Researcher Dr. John Clemens discovered in the lab he was also infected with the virus, possibly indicating the lab was still operational to some level. He left instructions to his girlfriend, fellow Umbrella employee Ada Wong, to kill him should she come looking for him. There is just one more thing, and it is my last request. I hope you never have to lay eyes on me in this state. But if you do happen to run into me in my hideous form, I beg you to put me out of my misery. I hope you understand. Thank you, Ada.
a grisly discovery back here tonight. The first known civilian death in the incident was that of a young woman, estimated to be 20 years old, who washed up on the Marble River's bank in Cedar, on the outskirts of Raccoon City on the night of Wednesday, May 20th. The Raccoon Police Department revealed in a press conference she had suffered lacerations to her arms and was missing her left foot. Given the force at which bite marks appeared to have been inflicted, it was determined she had been killed by a grizzly bear or similar creature, and her body was swept away by the river from the mountains. A mountaineering boot on her right foot suggested she was out hiking at the time of the attack and may have been an out-of-state tourist. By mid-July, the total number of mysterious murders in and around the city grew to 20. 13 Raccoon City citizens and 7 out-of-state hikers in 5 different incidents. The investigation into the deaths conducted by the Raccoon Police Department was extensive but yielded no results. Due to the excessive nature of some mutilations, some younger victims were so unrecognizable that even parental identification was having setbacks, with some victims' faces being ripped open and their abdomen regions being completely excavated. Information given to the press was also deliberately limited. One police officer estimated that coverage of the violence did not even constitute 10% of the injuries committed on victims. The Raccoon Police Department had quickly determined cannibalism to be part of the murders and could not rule out that at least some victims were eaten while alive. The police were starting to build a theory in which the murders must have been committed by a group of violent cultists who would presumably consume narcotics before killing and eating their human sacrifices. New and intense scrutiny on the activities of satanic cults. Stories of devil worship and satanic cults corrupting young minds. The police began asking questions at the Raccoon General Hospital and local pharmacies, hoping to find patients with suspicious injuries. Talk to them as they recorded me, and they start telling me about devil worshiping. And began searching for evidence of any violent cult groups active in the area. Satanic worship was satanic worship. It's like being a Catholic. You believe in God and you believe in Jesus. They believe in Satan. Even though these investigations made no progress. We just haven't found it in the woods yet. We need protection. We are paying taxes. It was decided that, regardless of cult activity, a gang of killers must have been using the mountains as a base of sorts. They will be searching this area in the next few days to see what they can find. As one police officer told us tonight, God knows what they can find here. On July 9th, the police closed off all roads leading to the Arclay Mountain region and began considering assigning the case to the Special Tactics and Rescue Service. The planning of the mission would fall upon Albert Wesker, who had been made captain of the STARS team by Umbrella to assist the corrupt Chief Brian Irons in ensuring the department, or STARS, never interfered with their actions. In time, I shifted my position to STARS, a special forces unit of the Raccoon Police Department. Umbrella, for crisis management reasons of their illegal bioorganic weapons development, had many of its people working in the police department. I became the leader of STARS and conducted all sorts of intelligence activities for Umbrella. As I continued to serve, I devised my own plans and waited for the right moment to execute them. Then at last, opportunity knocked. The freak murder incident that occurred in a forest near the mansion started it all. The mansion was Umbrella's secret bow laboratory, and it was clear that the in-development T-virus was the cause of the murder. Initially, Umbrella instructed me secretively to keep STARS out of the case, but with the heightened emotions of the citizens, STARS had no choice but to move in. Wesker is tasked with removing the evidence of Umbrella's experiments before STARS' arrival, and he was also to be present at the training facility for its reclamation. 
Given Umbrella was unaware that the Arclay Labs outbreak had reached the training facility, on the night of July 23rd, they had sent out a train, the Ecliptic Express, carrying Umbrella employees to the training facility, with intent on reopening and staffing the facility. Yeah. Do about it. Hold off for a while. But I wonder how those are. The train would fall under attack by mutant leeches carrying the Epsilon strain, controlled by the Queen Leech, never reaching its destination. That's when my next order was given. Dispatch stars to the mansion, dispose of them, then report the situation to headquarters so that their combat with the bow could be used for data analysis, allowing Umbrella a comprehensive portrait of the bow's combat abilities. The stars Bravo team was assigned orders to investigate the area around the Spencer mansion. The mansion and its purpose was unknown to the team therefore catching their suspicion as a possible location for their perceived killers. Bravo team took off by helicopter that same evening, two hours after the train was attacked. However, the helicopter had been sabotaged by Captain Wesker before takeoff and suffered an engine failure mid-flight, which forced it to crash land not far from the Spencer mansion. Oh. Captain Wesker was himself busy conducting the reclamation project for the nearby training facility. This act of sabotage worked to remove Bravo team from the equation. The six STARS officers under Captain Enrico Marini split up to search for escaped prisoner Marine Second Lieutenant Billy Cohen after two Marine MPs were found dead during a prison transport operation. All right, everyone, let's separate and survey the area. During this search, Rebecca Chambers and Edward Dewey found themselves on board the Ecliptic Express. Chambers herself spent the night in what became known as the Ecliptic Express Incident. This is Officer Chambers from Stars Bravo Team. Please identify yourself. <gasps> Due to Miss Chambers' age, lack of experience, and being a rookie at the time, some speculate she could not have survived the ordeal alone. Though she denies these claims to this day, rumors persist that she did in fact come across Billy Cohen, and that he may have helped her reach the Spencer Mansion. If 
virus is out. We can't hide this anymore. It appears Umbrella is finished. We're just gonna walk away? Our research isn't complete. We can make a more powerful virus. Do what you like. The T-Virus is near completion and only needs test data. That is why STARS is in place. I will bring them into the mansion. Damn it! I better get rid of this place before there are any more complications. As Rebecca and Billy made their way through the training facility and its grounds, they battled numerous B.O.W.s and eventually came across the Queen Leech, who had been roaming around using the likeness of James Marcus. The T-Virus fused with the leeches and brought me back from the darkness of death. Now, I will have my revenge on Umbrella, and the world will... Burn in an inferno of hate! The pair was able to destroy the Queen Leech, just as William Birkin activated the training facility's self-destruct system. say goodbye. People are waiting for me. Officially, Lieutenant Billy Cohen is dead. Rebecca, thank you. overcame impossible odds and made it out alive. Lucky, I suppose. Since the event, Billy Cohen has gone missing. While Rebecca is about to enter a new nightmare as she heads for the mansion. Meanwhile, Umbrella changed its plans for the operation, which they now dubbed X-Day. Rather than rely on Captain Wesker in obtaining the bioweapons data, Colonel Sergei Vladimir, head of the UBCS, was sent into the laboratory to obtain the research data in person. As for Wesker, it was now his job to lure the remaining STARS team to the Spencer Mansion. There, they would encounter the escaped BOWs, and it was expected that they would not survive. This would eliminate the threat of any formal investigations being conducted by STARS, and would also provide the company with usable combat data to prove the viability of their B.O.W. creations as weapons against armed and trained individuals. The plans to reuse the management training facility were scrapped by Marcus's unfortunate outburst. Not only that, but the incident appeared to spread the virus to the area surrounding the mansion, causing a biohazard outbreak. It is time to abandon the sinking ship that is Umbrella. Where might you be going, comrade? 
My next mission. The reclamation of the management training facility was your mission. And now you're just going to walk away without taking responsibility for your failure. The T-Virus has escaped. I will detonate the facility and dispose of it. Comrade, don't forget who's in charge. You can't just do what you feel like. I regrouped with the Star's Alpha Team. There was no time for delays. Umbrella's command structure was in motion, and the real struggle was about to begin. According to Miss Chambers' testimony, on the morning of Friday, July 24th, she arrived at the Spencer Mansion and, failing to find anyone, went to sleep in the dormitory buildings. After splitting up with Billy, I went to the mansion where Bravo Team was to rendezvous. When I arrived, I found that none of the others were there, and the mansion was unsettlingly quiet. I was exhausted from the events of the previous day, and before I knew it, I had drifted into a nightmare. You're okay? In the evening, she was awoken by Richard Aiken, who was himself also searching for their lost comrades. And Edward's dead. I see. It's not much better on my end either. <laughs> what a horrible first assignment, huh? First, we have to get to someplace safe. The loss of contact with Kevin Dooley, who had already been dead for 24 hours, directly warranted the departure of Captain Wesker's Alpha Team on the evening of the 24th. Raccoon City, where we are searching for the helicopter of our compatriots, Bravo Team, who disappeared during the middle of their mission. No, not yet, The Bravo Team was sent in to investigate. But we lost contact. Look, Chris! Bravo Team's helicopter was a derelict. Save for the remaining body of Kevin. We continued our search for the other members. And it turned into a nightmare. Five survivors from the initial 11 STARS members. From the Alpha team were Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, and Barry Burton. And from the Bravo team were Rebecca Chambers and Enrico Marini.
three STARS members left now. Captain Wesker, Barry, and myself. We don't know where Chris is. What is this place? The Spencer Mansion incident lasted throughout the night of July 24th and into the early morning hours of July 25th. In that time, Jill Valentine made her way through the mansion, occasionally reuniting with Barry Burton as he made his way through the house. Upon entering the mansion, the team discovered Officer Kenneth Sullivan being killed by a zombie. Barry! What is it? Look out! It's a monster! Let me take care of it! As the house was explored further, the rest of Bravo team was discovered in various areas, deceased, and Wesker was performing evidence cleanup after capturing and imprisoning Chris Redfield in the laboratory below the mansion. Ahead of the departure, Captain Wesker manipulated Barry Burton into believing his wife and daughters, Moira and Polly, were being held hostage by Umbrella security staff, and that Burton had to assist him in destroying incriminating data which might survive the lab explosion, lest his loved ones be killed. I decided to have one of them play the Judas and draw them to the tyrant. That Judas was Barry. Barry! Barry was the strong truth and justice kind and cherished his family more than anything. His type is easy to manipulate. I simply took that most important thing away from him. While searching the mansion, Rebecca and Richard are attacked by the Yawn, an escaped T-Virus test subject, gravely injuring Richard. Rebecca! Richard! How long Chambers stayed with Aiken following the attack is uncertain, and certain accounts are conflicting, though it appears she eventually left him to go to the mansion's storeroom, where serums were being stored. Richard! Don't make that face at me. We've still got to have hope. Someone will come and rescue us. I, I know it. I hated how hopeless I felt, seeing Richard lying there, wounded. I had to be stronger. I had to fight. And I had to survive. No matter what happened. I'll prove I have what it takes to survive. Jill would battle her way through various parts of the mansion grounds, uncovering more about its true purpose while struggling to stay alive. The house was filled with escaped BOW creatures and zombified staff, but on top of that, the trap Spencer had George Trevor build also stood in the way, making blind navigation of the structure extremely dangerous. Just as well, Lisa Trevor had made her way back to the mansion at some point after the outbreak, stalking the grounds and setting her attention towards the STARS team. Wesker. Jill, so you're safe. 
That's what I was going to say. I apologize. It was all I could do to protect myself against those strange creatures. I understand. Anyway, it's good that you're safe. Did you notice? Barry, he sounded a little flaky. Now that you mention it, yeah. I'll keep a close eye. Maybe it's quite natural under these circumstances. It's not really our standard operation. Jill, our first priority is to get out of here. I agree. There are still rooms in that mansion we can't get into because they're locked up. I've been looking for ways to... Okay, if there's anything, I'll go back to the other mansion. I'm counting on you. It was time to begin executing my plans. In the midst of the whole affair, I could take Umbrella's ultimate bio-organic weapon, the Tyrant, and join forces with an opposing corporation of Umbrella. To buy into that opposing corporation, I would need the actual combat data of the Tyrant. He would use stars to distract Umbrella from any suspicion, steal data, blow up the laboratory to cover up everything, and then sell the data to a rival company. The surviving privileged members of STARS were just the perfect bait. With the family man, Barry, playing the Judas, the scheme went as planned. Then the winds turned oh, unexpectedly. Jill. What good timing. A moment ago, I heard someone's voice coming from this hole. Is that Jill? Is that voice Enrico's? Listen, the stars are going to be finished soon. Someone is a traitor. Everything was plotted from the start by Umbrella. I had to eliminate Enrico, who found out what was behind Enrico! it all. I used Barry to get to him. Traitor? Who? Jill and Barry made their way through the underground tunnels, avoiding Lisa Trevor and eventually finding the secret entrance to the Arclay Laboratory. At some point around this time, Captain Wesker infected himself with a prototype virus, handed to him by Dr. William Birkin. I injected the virus I obtained from Birkin in advance. If I made Umbrella believe I was dead, it made it far more convenient to sell myself to the opposing corporation. According to Birkin, the virus had profound effects. It would put my body in a state of temporary death. It would then bring me back to life with superhuman powers. I awaited the sample specimen that Barry would bring to me Wesker. in the tyrant's room. Thank you, Barry. Well, what do you know? Oh, don't blame Barry for everything. I hear that his better half and two lovely daughters will be in danger if he doesn't do everything I tell him to. Barry, go up on the ground and wait there. Barry? <laughs> you gotta love Barry. He must really be afraid of Umbrella. You and Umbrella took his family, you bastard. Oh. Umbrella? Well, I used some carrots and sticks to cow him, but it had nothing to do with Umbrella. I just used Barry for my personal interests. Though both you and Barry seem to think I was following Umbrella's orders. What? What are you planning? I guess it's time for show and tell. I unleashed an awesome tyrant from its slumber and let it attack me. Oh, 
viral cultured freak. As my consciousness faded away, I was certain that the whole scheme would end in success. Vickers still flying around the forest above ground, the remaining team raced to the rooftop, intent on getting his attention. Jill Valentine had also discovered Chris Jill, Redfield, Chris, alive and well, okay. being held captive in a prison cell. Anything on Wesker? We'll talk later. First, let's get going. The virus that Birkin had created brought me back from the brink of annihilation. When I awoke, Hatred became my master. Having betrayed Umbrella for nothing, Wesker decided to simply escape the laboratory and take advantage of his assumed death for the time being. Emergency. The I found the tyrant that killed me was dead, and the facility was just moments away from self-destruction. I did not have time to enjoy my newfound life. I had something I needed to do. To grab the data and get out. Due to the emergency condition, all data has been backed up to the UN at 013. Sergei was busy. Save that for later. Let's get moving. Three minutes to detonation. Damn it! We're almost there! Jill, you just get in contact with Brad. that stars could slay the evil creation. I lost the tyrant and the plan I devised which cost me my humanity ended in failure. According to the Wesker report, he trapped Lisa Trevor underneath a chandelier in the mansion's main hall just as he was about to escape. Wesker escaped the mansion just as it exploded, using his newly acquired abilities from the viral enhancement. It was near daybreak on July 25th when the incident at the mansion drew to a close. 
except for Chris and a few others. The RPD stars were wiped out. All of the evidence of the event had vanished with the destruction of the mansion. And so I was reborn like a phoenix emerging from the flame. I no longer needed umbrella. A new horizon stretched out before me. I had risen beyond the human race and cheated death itself, leaving nothing to oppose me. The laboratory's explosion caused devastation within the Arclay Mountains. A total of 750 acres of forest was destroyed by the resulting fires. The fire was so large, in fact, that the Raccoon Fire Department found itself under-equipped to battle the blaze. Mayor Michael Warren quickly authorized the Army National Guard to assist in the firefight. Upon their return to Raccoon City, the remainder of the STARS team demanded an immediate investigation into Umbrella. Despite the STARS team's acquired evidence, and the mysterious circumstances surrounding the mansion's destruction, Chief Irons was able to quell media curiosity and quickly had the team disbanded and discredited. From this point, the corrupt Chief Brian Irons would assist Umbrella in covering up the extent of the damage done, a cover-up that would keep Raccoon City blind to the truth all the way up to the end. As you have seen, there were several early warning signs and red flags, spelling out that, at the very least, something bad was coming to Raccoon City. As summer turned to fall, people started looking away from the Star's raid and murders, and began looking forward to the escape in which autumn holidays tend to bring. As a result of the mansion incident, the T-Virus was spread into the abandoned hospital. The body of Dorothy, still in storage in the hospital basement, was consumed by a monstrous plant. This was seen by former director Lester as the reincarnation of his wife. He dubbed the plant Dorothy and kept it nourished by feeding it various forest animals he would kill. It wouldn't be long before Al Lester began targeting campers and hikers in the Arclay Forest as well. When Birkin's discovery of the Golgotha, or G-Virus, got Spencer's attention, Umbrella constructed the underground nest facility, adjacent to their chemical plant, in the city outskirts which was completed in 1991. There, Birkin was chief researcher and directly led research into Golgotha with his wife, Annette, and a team of researchers, with unrelated BOW projects also conducted by other teams in the facility. The Raccoon Police Department's chief, Brian Irons, received bribes to keep any investigations away from the laboratory and was given updates as to the research that was conducted within. However, though work on G was promising along the 1990s, Birkin began to suspect Umbrella was disinterested in giving him a position as a corporate executive, causing him to become bitter. After the Arclay Lab and Training Facility explosions in July of 1998, Birkin, adamant on completing the G-Virus, officially stayed with the company even after drawing the ire of Umbrella Executive Colonel Sergei Vladimir, who blamed Birkin and Wesker for losing control of the two laboratories in the first place. Plotting to betray them from the inside, Birkin entered talks with the US military to sell them the G-Virus for their own bioweapons project in exchange for an asylum agreement for him and his family. Sometime early in the day on September 22nd, Birkin decided to enact his betrayal after being contacted by the military about their acceptance of his terms. Birkin knew Umbrella would find out, given their deep ties to the military. In an effort to buy himself time, Birkin began sabotaging the nest and connecting facilities. 
the newly commissioned P-12A facility, designed to process contaminated waste, was rendered useless when Birkin flooded the facility with a radically accelerated supply of failed test subjects. The T-virus also began to make its way around the city in a limited fashion, infecting the staff at a water treatment plant near the Raccoon Police Station and sending dozens to the hospital to be treated for the so-called cannibal disease. Upon discovering Birkin's plan to hand himself and the G-Virus over to the military, Umbrella deployed two USS, or Umbrella Security Service units, to capture Birkin alive and retrieve any TNG virus samples in his possession. Dr. Birkin, you come along with us quietly. You think I didn't know you were coming? This is my life's work! I'm not handing over anything! We have our orders, Dr. Birkin. I'll ask you one more time. Hold your fire! What the fuck were you thinking? Our orders were to bring him in alive! We're in, sir. We had a snafu. Target resisted. We had to take him out. That's correct, sir. Roger that. Just the samples, then. Let's move. As the squad takes off with the sample attached case through the sewers, a gravely injured William Birkin makes a desperate decision. Injecting himself with an overlooked sample of the G-Virus. G-Virus into his own body? Birkin, who is now a mutated G variant, pursues the USS squad through the sewers as they attempt to evacuate, destroying any squad members as he finds them. Once he finds the viral sample attach case, he begins to consume the G samples within, while also destroying the capsules containing T samples.
As the USS are destroyed by William, rats within the sewers began ingesting the contents of the smashed tea samples. These rats would later swarm and contaminate the Raccoon City water reservoir with the tea virus. It is still unclear how, but Umbrella was aware of the infected rats contaminating Victory Lake, which was Raccoon City's water reservoir, and began warning key company and city officials of the impending outbreak by the evening of September 23rd. One of these officials was RPD Chief Brian Irons. When briefed of the emergency on the night of the 23rd, Irons became hysterical and began preparations to botch police operations as per orders from Umbrella. A man who was already plagued by violent anger. I accidentally moved one of the stone statues on the second floor when I leaned against it. When the chief found out about it, he was furious. I swear the guy nearly bit my head off screaming at me to never touch the statue again. If it's so important, then maybe he shouldn't have put it out in the open like that. Irons was said to have come undone due to his current frustration and worries regarding Umbrella's failure to contain the Arclay outbreak. Mayor Michael Warren was also one of the first to be alerted and departed the city immediately leaving his daughter Catherine in the care of Chief Irons. The mayor assumed she would be safe with Irons while he awaited the situation to improve from outside the city. This photograph recovered by Raccoon City survivor Claire Redfield shows Catherine Warren deceased. It was found within Brian Irons' personal journal which was also recovered by Miss Redfield. The Chief's recovered diary contains many admissions to corrupt deeds and murders. The diary's last entry was written on September 26th, and though there is no admission to Catherine Warren's murder, he does write about wanting to hunt her, and refers to her as his new trophy. wants to make it perfectly clear that this is not a case of bioterrorism. No such agents exist in the arsenal of any nation or known terrorist group. This pandemic has spread faster than any disease in modern history. Yes, in that the circulatory, respiratory, and other vital functions are terminated, these subjects are technically deceased. Please just let me get through this and then I'll take the CDC has quarantined the lower Midwestern region of the U.S. This is a minor, containable situation that we expect to see fully resolved in 24 hours or less. Again, that was Press Secretary William Kaplan with the first official statement from the White House a little over 30 minutes ago, stressing calm and what he assures us is a fully containable situation. 